Hello. Sorry, that wasn't Hello. a great spot, was it? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't get sent the link, so I was sitting there going, oh, where's the link? <laughs> um, well, we're, um, we're live now, uh, Anne, so um, welcome, both of you, Aradna and Anne, and welcome to everybody else that's joined us as well to the Rise in Conversation with series. I'm hosting it again today, and um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Tanya Rai. I was a mentee on the Rise Mentoring Programme last year, and I'm now board member of Rise. Today we have joining us Aradna Tayal and Anne Charles. They run Radio TechCon, the UK radio and audio industry's technical and engineering conference. Once run by the Radio Academy, Aradna and Anne, as well as other members of the Radio TechCon committee, formed TBC Media Limited in 2016 to run it independently when the Radio Academy no longer had the resources needed to continue to deliver it. Realising that without this conference, the industry would be missing out, they decided to take matters into their own hands. Since 2016, Aradna and Anne have delivered Radio TechCon every year, reaching hundreds of engineers, technologists and producers over that time. Before we begin this conversation with them, I did want to talk a little bit about their careers. And Aradna trained as a broadcast engineer at the BBC and in over 10 years of service, she worked as a trainer, event producer, distribution manager and a lead technologist to deliver an ambitious technology strategy for BBC Archives. She then left the BBC to pursue a freelance career working for various arts organisations, including Sadler's Wells and the National Theatre. Anne also began uh, her career at the BBC and again was there for just over 10 years. She started out as a broadcast assistant for BBC East and, uh, and then moved into an assistant producer role responsible for live and pre-recorded studio and programme production. Here she also specialised as a children radio producer for BBC Radio 4 and 7 and she also spent six months working at BBC World Service. Her move into technology came when she took on a project manager role as an audio edit and playout specialist, delivering radio playout systems, including all new technology to the BBC for key projects in both London and Salford. Since then, she has been working as a consultant across all areas of the radio, audio and podcasting industry. So there you have it. That's my introduction to you both. Welcome, Aradna and Anne. And thank, thank you for you. joining us today. Um, Right, we uh, want to get stuck in because we've got a lot that we want to cover and um, of course we want those of you who are watching to be able to chip in with questions as well. So please do so using the Q&A um, function in the box below and um, I'll keep an eye on the questions coming in and if I think that they're relevant to ask there and then I will ask them. Uh, otherwise I will wait until the last 15 minutes of this webinar which we will um, use for a Q&A session and I will make sure I ask, ask as many of your questions as I can. So um, Arada and Anne, first of all, um, could you give a brief overview of your various different roles that you work in right now? And Aradna, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, sure, hi, um, it's really nice to be here. Um, so as you said, I, I left the BBC um, about four years ago now, um, uh, in order to have more of a portfolio career. Um, so I, my interests and uh, background and skills sort of span both technology and production across media and art. And I, I think it's really important to be able to bring those two things together. And I'm a better engineer for being able to produce films and I'm a, a better producer and project manager for my knowledge of um, engineering and technology um, and I wanted to sort of be able to do both of those things whereas um, before I felt you know I was kind of jumping from from job to job different roles different projects which was great but I sort of wanted to do them all at the same time <laughs> so um, at the moment I have been um, producing events for um, sort of television conferences for commissioning and production um, I've also delivered arts conferences to bring together artists and arts organizations from across the UK um, I've done some consultancy um, on diversity and inclusion which is really important to me um, working, I've sort of, you know, done a bit of that my whole career um, and then specifically started doing some consultancy for, for certain arts organisations. Um, I'm 
also <laughs> doing a few voluntary roles. I'm a trustee of the Radio Academy and on the Committee for the Royal Television Society. So sort of help with events and championing the importance of our industry. And then of course running Radio Techcom with them. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that's um, a lot of very different roles there. Sounds amazing. And um, how about you, Anne? A similar thing really um because i can make programs and i love technology being able to do both is really important to me and um, so at the moment things are a little bit quieter unfortunately because a lot of stuff that i might have done on site has calmed down a bit due to coronavirus but i um i my main client is broadcast bionics so i work with them a lot of the time and they send me all over the world to do training and go live support and also to help them with some product development on their systems. TechCon takes way more time than it should but it's a lot of fun so that's that's good because throughout the year you're always on duty kind of going to events chatting to people trying to see what might make a good topic to discuss. I do quite a lot of training and um, bits of consultancy. Sometimes people just want me to run a mini project for them and they've got a particular problem they want to solve and they hire me in to um, I mean, I did a project recently on metadata structures. Go, I love a bit of metadata. Um, and, uh, yeah, metadata is great. Don't get me started. Metadata and accessibility are the two buzzwords that everyone on the TechCon committee knows not to get me started on. Um, and I've also been doing some work recently to help organisations who want to um, create good quality podcasts. So thinking through the technology and the production side. Um, and then just a lot of thinking about the future of radio and audio as a whole and what we might need to shape our future um, and the technology we, we need to get there. At the moment, I'm really excited about the possibilities of um, object based broadcasting. I was doing a bit of work at the BBC last year on their studios of the future. Um, so I'm very lucky I get to hang out in radio studios all around the world and get paid for it. So what could be better? Yeah, amazing. Again, um, very varied. Um, right, so um, I, I know, I think you guys have known each other quite a long time, so I wanted to, to um, get the audience to have a feel about how long you have known each other and, and how you met. So Anne, could you start off um, by answering that question? Well, I think we met um, when I had a three month, what the BBC calls um, an attachment, which anywhere normal would call us a comment, um, as a broadcast engineer. So I'd been working in production and I got some funding from the BBC to go and learn about broadcast engineering. And Radna was working in the same department and being two young women in a department, we kind of immediately were like, oh, hello, there's another person. There's another woman, hooray. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so um, I remember that really well because I, I think I even specifically remember where we were. We were sat in, in the actual workshop there, you know, that took kit open on the desk and, and it was literally like, oh, and another a lady. Woman, but there's only two of us and you're not to the other one. Oh. <laughs> and, then, um, and then actually we, we sort of stayed in touch, didn't we? And I, when you went off to work in, um, uh, in the projects department, um, at the time, um, Tanya, you'll remember this, um, I was running uh, BBC Women Engineering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was sort of a, a year-long initiative to really kind of boost um, the women we had working in technology um, and engineering and also kind of as the BBC open our doors to, you know, women and uh, girls at school. Um, and so while I was running that, um, I was able to invite Anne, who, who kindly came and spoke at one of those events. And of course, it was about metadata. Um, and uh, they were just, uh, we were just building a new broadcasting house at the BBC. So it links us all back around. Yeah, it does. It does. And, um, you know, when we were chatting, prepping for, the, for, for this webinar, um, I remember saying to you, you know, I really thoroughly really enjoyed working with you uh, on that. And it was, it was so fantastic to be able to go around the schools around the country um, and uh, I particularly remembered BBC Cardiff because um, they had just opened their new um, studios at that point I think or it was the new um, god what, what's it called at BBC Cardiff something card something bay am I, am I just getting uh, yeah, they just opened the drama studios down the day yeah 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 so that was um, that was really cool 
Um, right, well, you mentioned Radio TechCon, um, and it's happening on the 30th of November, and it will take place either face-to-face -face or virtually over the ether, depending on what the government social distancing rules are at that point. Can you tell us a bit more about Radio TechCon and how you both ended up running it and what it aims to do? I don't know if you can start with that. Um, yeah, so I, Radio TechCon has been running in some guys for years and years, I, I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I wouldn't be far off if I said 40 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not always called Radio TechCon, but that sort of thing. Um, and um, I think Anne and I were both approached, um, oh gosh, probably about seven, eight years ago or so, um, by Dave Walters, who was the, the um, chair of the TechCon committee at the time for the Radio Academy, who very openly came um, over and just said, hi, I need more women on TechCon because we don't have any and that's ridiculous. Um, and I was working as um, a broadcast technology trainer at the time for the BBC Academy, um, training on the audio and edit layout systems. Um, and I, I don't think I'd heard of it before. And I was just, I was like, okay, well, what is it? And I started going along to some um, committee meetings, see what it was like, met a really brilliant bunch of people, and then went to my first tech on um, in Salford, in Manchester, with Anne. So I think, Anne, you had a similar story to that. Yeah, so exactly the same. Dave went, we don't have enough women on, uh, so let's, rather than pretending we know what women might be interested in and having that perspective, let's have some. And I was involved with Sound Women, um, which the organisation has now closed, but we kind of carry on a Sound Women network on Facebook. But Dave got in touch with Sound Women and said, um, I need some women who like technology. And Sound Women were like, we've got Anne. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, that's how we went along. And I'm sure it's a decision Dave regrets every day because of course, ironically, <laughs> um, him bringing us on when, when things then started meaning that the Radio Academy couldn't run it, it's kind of really funny that it's ended up with us two now <laughs> taking it on and running the whole thing. So, I, I think it's brilliant, isn't it, Anne? Because, um, you know, Dave was just, he was really honest and noticed and, you know, did something about it. So we went on and... I think Radio TechCon has come on leaps and bounds since then, you know, obviously. Um, I'm not saying it was because of us, but, you know. <laughs> We've just, we have sold it out <laughs> twice in the last two years and increased the numbers every year we've run it. But apart from that. <laughs> um, and I think it does make a difference because you just, you have, um, you know, the committee's constantly evolving. It's made up of people um, who work across the industry, uh, broadcasters, manufacturers, um, freelancers, podcasters. Um, and, you know, you need to keep bringing in different people and keep looking at your committee and make sure that you've got a really representative um, group of people. Um, and so we got really um, heavily involved, um, really heavily, in fact, within a year, I sort of charged in and said, oh, well, BBC can do this and this. And, you know, they sort of wanted to run a, a technology masterclass, which was great. So it... I think that's what happens, you know, you bring in new people and then new ideas sprout and, and you can go with them. So it was about four years ago, um, yeah, 2016, um, the, the Radio Academy went uh, and went some changes and Radio TechCon probably wasn't going to happen that year. And um, a few of us had individually been thinking, well, that's terrible, we should do something about it, um, which came around to myself and Anne and another colleague at the time, uh, coming together, the three of us were freelancers. I was just about to leave the BBC. Um, and so I had the time. Um, and we said, well, we can't really let this happen. So we, we decided to run it. We kind of went back to the committee, went to the radio cabin and said, well, we're, we're thinking of just doing it anyway. Will you come? <laughs> Um, and so we set up a company, we sort of put a bit of money in each ourselves and kind of with a wing and a prayer just thought, we think this is too important not to do, so experimentally let's give it a try. And the, the industry backed us because it's just too important not to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I can't remember how many people we had in that first one, but it was full. Um, and yeah, we're now four years down the line and the last two years, as I mentioned, we sold out. That's amazing and good for you and what guts and tenacity to go right okay 
we're going to do something about this and, and take the ball by the horns and, and make it happen. So, yeah. Good I, I think we, we talk a lot about diversity um, because it's really important for us all and we're really passionate about it. But I think the thing with TechCon as well is it recognises diversity within the industry because technology and engineering is a minority sport within our industry as well. And it, it was the one day of the year, especially in the radio space, where people could get together and the joke was always it was the engineering safe space. It was that one time in the year where you could talk peer to peer and you didn't have to explain slowly and gently what metadata was um, or, or kind of water it down so that people who didn't care about technology had to understand it. I mean, we worked very hard to make sure it's accessible, don't get me wrong, but it was so important to keep that community together because anyone who works in engineering and technology knows that those people are absolutely vital for keeping our stations and networks on air and also innovating and thinking about the future and they're often overlooked so yeah for me it was really that community had been so important over the last few years that I just didn't want to see it fall apart it would have just been terrible yeah it would have been it would have been so I'm, I'm glad to hear that this is happening and, and you're making that difference um, I was really pleased um, that you had both agreed to speak because you are making such a success out of Radio TechCon and as well as that you're both doing consultancy roles on an individual basis and I wanted to be able to show our members, particularly the younger ones, that success doesn't necessarily mean being ahead of a media department uh, in a global organisation um, and, and obviously that's a great aspiration to have but I I, I say this because up until very recently, that's what I had strived um, towards. And I've, but I've also been a freelancer and I love the lifestyle of being able to work on varied projects and career wise, I was very happy. So I would say now that my definition of success in terms of a career at least is being happy in the work that I do. Uh, what do you think about that? Would you agree and why? Um, let's start with you, Anne. Yeah, well, I think that's got to be an absolute basis, hasn't it? Um, if you're not more happy than you're not for most of the time then you do need to change something um I think for me it is yeah it is about how you feel and also about the, it is nice to feel that you've got some sort of impact um it's nice to feel that you've made something or you've been part of something that's had an effect on either an individual or a whole country or the whole world you know sometimes in, in especially in broadcasting and in radio we can do things that that millions of people will be affected by um, and I think it's also something especially in this time at the moment where people maybe who aren't used to working from home or working differently have been it really is a time for companies as well to sit back and reflect on on how they can make things better for their employees too because often your employees will have told you what they would like and how they would like to work and how they best work and you know there's so there seems to be a pattern I think when people get to around the 30 year hump um <laughs> I've seen that quite a bit where people kind of want to change things and, and move on and so some of it can be within organizations as well allowing people to be the individuals they are and not pigeonholing them into one job or another if they've got skills across multiple areas yeah what are your thoughts Aradna on that um yeah, I think, I mean, what we perceive as success, I mean, that it, it comes from so many different places. It comes from your parents, it comes from your teachers, it comes from society, it comes from what you see your friends doing, um, from what you see in the media. Mm. And, you know, what, what you want for yourself. I think, it's, I think it's actually really hard and takes a lot of... Um, experimenting to decide what and what success looks like for you um, and I think it might change as you move through your career as you get older as you have different expectations of your personal life as well um, for me uh, you know it was a really really big decision um, to leave the BBC it, it was not something I did lightly I'd, I had my first job at BBC when I was 18, I was a student, um, I was studying engineering and, and I, I did um, a work placement every summer there and then I got the, the graduate trainee job and, and so, you know, to be there, okay, whatever, 14 or something years later, it was like leaving home for the first time and I'd had so much opportunity as well at BBC and I was, I was doing well. Um, I, 
it's hard to say that, you know, like I'm gonna own it, I was doing well. Um, I was doing really interesting jobs, felt like I was making a difference. And I just thought um, there were various factors that, that led into it. But ultimately, the, the final thing was I just thought, okay, well, when you know, I'm 80 or 90 or 100, who knows how long I'll live, um, will, I, will I look back and will I regret leaving this golden path and this amazing you know, organisation where I can do this stuff? Or will I regret not leaving and walking off into the forest and just seeing what I could do? And it was the latter. And I just thought, I've, I've got to try. I just had this feeling inside me that I wanted to try these different things. I wanted to, I was already working a lot with other organisations. I kind of wanted more of that. And I, I wanted to grow myself and build my experiences um, and achieve different things. And through that journey, um, one of the things that I thought about a lot was leadership. I was on this um, this leadership programme at the time, which I was really lucky to be on, um, with the uh, CLAW leadership programme, um, sort of affiliated with them. And, and so it got me thinking a lot about it. And I did think, oh, well, you know, at first you think, well, a leader, that's, that's the head of a company, isn't it? Or a, a CTO or something like that. And I think through thinking about the word leadership and what it means to me and what I wanted for myself, you know, do I want to be a leader? Well, actually, yes, I do. I am ambitious. But what it means to me is not necessarily heading up a department and managing lots of people. It's about making a difference, having influence, um, being able to change things and inspire others to do that. I, I haven't achieved everything I want to achieve. I, I don't. I hope that I do some of that at the moment, um, but I've got a long way to go and who knows where that's going to lead me and maybe that will change for me as well. But you've just got to partly go with your instincts and partly be really open to this idea of, you know, success is going to mean completely different things depending on who you are and where you are. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think, you know, it was really brave of both of you um, to to have made that move because the BBC um having worked there myself it, it is a bit of a safety blanket isn't it it can be a comfort blanket in terms of it's a big organization and you know as long as you're doing a good job and you've got your permanent contract then you know you you can kind of not sit back but you, you you've got that security um so yeah again good for you both of you um now, I mentioned your career paths in my introduction and um, Aradna, you've already spoken a little bit briefly in your previous answer about how you started your career, but maybe you could expand on that. Um, but I, yeah, I wanted to be able to cast your minds back to your younger days and, and ask what it was that made you take um, the step into your chosen field and at the beginning of your careers. And, and let's, um, let's talk to you first because you've got a, a, an interesting kind of uh, story about how you got in into radio to start with yeah 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 well so i mean this this sounds a bit wanky but i always say you know radio is totally a vocation for me it's not something i wanted to do it's something i kind of had to do because it's not a sensible career is it you can kind of go into a job where it's it's not very secure and it's not very well paid and um yeah so i i remember when i was um when i was really little well, I don't know, not that little six, um, getting a radio. And I was listening up and down the dial to try and find something that was relevant to me. And that was the point where I decided that I wanted the BBC to have its own children's radio station and I was going to run it, which is lovely because I ended up working in children's <laughs> later on. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of happened upon the a radio station and it mentioned the town where I lived and I remember leaping out of bed and saying mum mum they just mentioned where we live on the radio and she was just like massively unimpressed and was just like oh that's probably the local radio station and I was like no but you don't understand you know where we live is famous it's important and so that's how I ended up and I honestly think that's probably how I ended up working at the BBC because if that had been a commercial station I'd have ended up working in commercial radio it was something that made a connection with me and was relevant and mm. so um yeah from there I then when I was a teenager 
um, did all the usual things, helping out in local theatre groups, and I helped to start the local talking newspaper, which is a free news service for visually impaired people. And from that, I did lots of reporting and, and teching, and I was on the committee and became a charity trustee, all of that kind of stuff. And from there, um, I happened to be interviewed on the local radio station about a book I'd been involved in writing, and then they invited me back to be their newspaper reviewer. Um, and I had no idea what I was agreeing to, but I was like, yes, that would be great. Uh, and then from there, I managed to get um, on the, they had this thing called the Action Desk. So I ended up volunteering twice a week. And from there, it turned into shifts and working on different programs and working on more programs. And then I became a news researcher and worked on drive time, uh, you know, on and on and on and on and on it went. So I think when you're starting out, it is about trying everything. And that background in local radio really helped me because I was often on my own in a building and I had literally half the country under my fingertips and the only help available was someone on the phone in Birmingham. So when people say, why did you get involved in engineering? It was like, because I had to, <laughs> because if something went wrong, it was in my interest to know how to mend it. And, um, and my engineering colleagues at the time were incredibly encouraging as well. So for me, it's always been that mixture of production and engineering going together, because the more you understand technology, the better programs you can make. And the more you understand programme makers, the better a technology person you can be. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what about you, Aradna? So you mentioned it a little bit further, a um, bit earlier, sorry. So could you expand? Um, yeah, well, so I, I started um, engineering. Um, well, so when I was a kid, I swore blind that I would never be an engineer <laughs> because, um, because both my mum and dad were engineers. Um, but what that did mean is that I never thought I couldn't do it. I just want wanted to do something completely different to my mum and dad obviously um and um so you know I, I liked science and especially maths um I didn't want to just study science or math I certainly didn't want to study medicine which is what everyone was just like oh you're clever and uh, good at maths and science obviously you must be a doctor that was no interest at all um and so I think it was it was just because I was aware of engineering of my parents in a way that a lot of kids at school aren't and the teachers don't necessarily know that much about it. Hopefully that's not the case so much anymore. Um, and I, I was also lucky enough to come across the something called the WISE campaign, which is still running, which is brilliant. Um, they, I think I must have been doing my GCSEs at the time and they organised um, a trip to um, Imperial College uh, in London um, to go and visit some of the different engineering departments so that you could learn a bit about the different disciplines and what was involved, what it would be like to study at, at university, which was just fantastic. It's just so eye-opening and it gave me all this information that you know my teachers didn't really have. As an, they were encouraging, I'm like, yeah, it sounds great, but it, it just wasn't something that people knew about. Um, and then of course, you know, I, my, all my parents encouragement and knowledge so I studied engineering um, I had to do um, a, a work placement as part of my degree every summer and um, my tutor sent me a link to this BBC um, vacation trainee scheme um, where they were calling out to universities to um, you know go and work there in your summers um, and actually, that was the first time I knew that you could be a BBC engineer. And to a lot of people, that sounds really ridiculous. It, it slightly sounds a bit ridiculous to me now. Um, a lot of the people that I came across, mostly men, um, said, you know, a lot of people like, I always knew I wanted to be a BBC engineer since I was six years old. And I just didn't know it was a job. I just, it didn't occur to me. Um, and um, um, when I found out, I was just like, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, so I should mention that the other thing I was going to do if I didn't become an engineer was I was going to be a dancer. <laughs> and, uh, I graduated oh, really? in, um, in sort of classical Indian dance. So it was a really bizarre crossroads <laughs> of dancer, engineer, dancer, engineer. And to be honest, like hearing that I could be an engineer at the BBC, was just kind of like oh well I've got it all then I mean I decided I don't want to dance myself but I spent the whole of university um, involved in theatre and so to me it was just it, it was amazing um, so then um, I 
I managed to get onto that uh, vacation training scheme and learn about what, what a BBC engineer does. Um, and then after I, after I did my master's, um, I got a job as a graduate trainee um, and then in radio. Um, and the reason I chose radio was because during the vacation trainee placements, um, I was able to move around to different departments. So I did my first one um, at BBC Manchester. Um, on Oxford Road, so I'm, I'm from Manchester, so um, which was amazing because BBC on, on Oxford uh, Road, it just, I mean, it just made that part of town it was so cool. And I'd gone to see kids' shows there when I was little, and it was so cool to work there with my own on BBC Pass. And I got to do a bit of, um, you know, working in the control room, working in the engineers' workshop. I went out on news OBs, outside broadcasts. And I got to sit in on radio shows and, and just the radio stuff just was so, so fun. Whereas the other bit, you know, going on a TV outside broadcast was a lot of sitting around. Mm. <laughs> so I think it was kind of on that, on that sort of basis that everyone just seemed to be having so much fun in radio. Everyone was so nice to me. Everyone gave me opportunity. And it just seemed a lot more creative as well because you know, it's, it's radio, the stuff that you can do with radio is incredible with, you know, like a tenth of the size of the crew round budget. Um, so then I went off and did a placement in network radio in, in London and then got a graduate trainee job there. And, and that's how I got into radio engineering. Oh, brilliant. Um, actually, that leads um, quite nicely onto the next question. So, I mean, you you both took those steps that um, you've just talked about in, in terms of getting into your career. What um, advice would you give to our younger members of Rise or those in the early stages of their careers in order to um, branch out and or do more or, or, or you know, work their way up um, within their chosen careers, which is primarily going to be broadcast technology? Um, Anne, could you answer that one first? Um, I'd say try everything. So shadow people, make friends with the engineers at your station, um, get involved in engineers tea time, um, see if you can spend a day with them or an afternoon or, um, and then and help them to see your job as well. So if you're in production, then, or if you're an engineer, then go and shadow some production and make sure that you vaguely know how to make a radio program yourself. Um, if you are supporting a piece of software, um, as an engineer, then make sure you know how your users are using it because it's really horrifically embarrassing and causes no trust at all if you go into a studio and you don't know how to do the thing they do all day every day because all you know is how the underneath of the database works. So um, I just think the more you can collaborate across these traditional divides, the more creative you're going to be. Um, if you are at a radio station and you're having your editorial meetings, then you should invite your engineer because they might well have some suggestions for you on how to make your OB more exciting or more fun. It, it, it kind of, it hooks back to the diversity thing, actually. You know how we say in, in all the diversity work we're all doing that the more diverse your team, the better your ideas. Well, that's, that goes for if you're making programs or if you're trying to solve problems with technology as well. You need to reach across your departments and make friends and um, that's probably the best advice. Make friends. Great advice. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, the best thing that I did when I first started um, in, in, as a graduate trainee uh, was I, I got to just go and sit in on um, loads of different uh, radio shows across all of the different networks to see how different, for example, it is, um, or how similar uh, to sit in Radio 4, or Radio 3, or One Extra, or wherever. Um, and then even much, much later in my career, it was actually probably thanks to um, joining the, the Radio Techcom Committee, um, getting to know a lot of the commercial uh, networks as well. And then likewise, going and visiting Global and going and visiting Bauer and getting to know how they do things and sitting in on their shows um, and, and just seeing a completely different world. Um, and then also kind of beyond that as well. So I guess you'll have people working for manufacturers 
Um, the same sort of thing applies. So if you're working on specific bits of kit, you know, go and talk to your customers and just get to get to know them a bit better. Ask if you can come and um, see them at work. I mean, to be honest, it's really good for your company because obviously you can go back with more knowledge of, well, actually, this is the sort of thing that people want. This is how they're using our kit. Um, but for your personal development, it's just really good to see what else is out there, what other roles, jobs, um, so just yeah just try things and I think don't be afraid of just experimenting a bit as well like get involved with the projects I also um, think as you as you go through your career I mean um, we haven't really talked about mentoring um, whether it's in a formal or informal capacity these people we're saying go and make friends with in my experience people are so generous with their time and uh, skills and encouragement um, and likewise, as you move through, you'll find how much you have to give to others. And I learn a huge amount about my own job <laughs> by, by telling others about it and sharing them around. So I think that's um, a really valuable thing to do. And I have to say, um, I'd really, well, hopefully anyone who's watching this webinar is already doing this, you know, kind of building your own um, training of your skills and development by joining things like this, by looking up online training, uh, attending master classes, um, because not only for what you'll learn, but also the people that you'll meet, like those are going to become your network and the people who you're going to probably work for or, or work to or, you know, be their boss or hire them and, um, or, you know, collaborate with. Brilliant. And if I could just very quickly add to that as well, because um, one thing that just occurred to me is certainly in radio, we are broadcast engineer is such a broad job title that I think when I first started out in technology, I thought that you sort of the only way you could be an engineer is to have that kind of the, the sort of classic background that Radler's got, actually, you know, she did the proper degree and then she did the proper BBC training. And I can remember thinking, oh, you know, I'm meant to know all of it. And I don't, and I'm such a fraud, and what am I bringing? But actually, as I've gone on, I realised that we're really a whole um, network of specialists. So, and you can be the world expert very quickly if you specialise in two or three things in radio or telly and two or three, I don't know, bits of software. It's, it's quite a small industry. So there is a space in broadcast engineering and technology for absolutely everyone and if you've got a program background you bring stuff and if you've got an electronic engineering background you bring stuff and if you've got a weird geeky obsession with accessibility you know you can pretty much own that quite quickly because there won't be hundreds of people who are competing um with whatever weird nugget of information you've got so it's it's good to have a, a basis of knowledge across all areas but actually we are a network of specialists and there is a place for you to develop your particular passions. Oh yeah, thank you for adding that. I think that's um, a really important point. And, and of course we did discuss that um, as we were prepping for this webinar as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, we have um, 20 minutes left in total. So just wanted to take the opportunity to remind the audience that you can um, put your questions forward if you want to, and I will keep an eye on the, uh, on the chat box coming in. Um, just because of the time that we've got left, uh, the one question I definitely wanted to be able to ask you um, on this was um, what one change would most improve diversity in technical careers in broadcast technology? And we've already touched upon um, a little bit in terms of, you know, the fact that throughout your careers, you've probably been the only women in the room or, um, you know, would, the anecdote that you recounted about when you first met, you know, it just goes to show how, you know how lacking it was in diversity when you first started out so um Arana, could you begin by answering that question yeah um to be honest i think there's loads of things that contribute to this so i'll probably cheat and mention more than one but i hope you forgive me um i think that we really 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 have to start in schools um i think that there's a lot that we can do throughout people's careers i think that career changes are so much more accepted um, now, which is great. But I still believe that, um, you know, if we're not going into schools and, and letting people know that this is an option, um, kids, boys and girls, um, this is the job, these are the different roles, these are the things that you can do, um, opening adults to it, then 
then how are we going to change things? And then, you know, likewise, we need to, as an industry, be open to welcoming different people. As Adam says, you know, we all bring something different. You don't need an engineering degree to be a really, really good broadcast engineer. There are, you know, you, there are skills that you will learn. <clears throat> You're going to have to um, have training. But you just need to know that it's there and understand what what in you um, wants to do that job. Are you inquisitive? Do you want to be creative and find new solutions? Do you want to be part of broadcasting brilliant programs? You know, what is the role that you want to play in it? And then we can kind of teach you a lot of the rest, you know, electronics, we can teach you that. <laughs> um, and I think, um, if I may, just one other one, which I think is kind of leading on from that is, I really, really believe in the importance of um, role models. Uh, it's at every single level of your career, which is why it's so brilliant that RISE are holding things like this, to be able to hear from different people, see the different jobs that people are doing, and hopefully have that moment of connection of, oh, well, that, that sort of speaks to me, or maybe maybe that's a little bit like me, or maybe I could do that. And, and you know, just being open about your career, about your own doubts, um, and you know ponderings and and just talking about it and having those those people men and women who you can really look up to and really say right yeah that's what I want to do I can, right this is my path. How about you Anne? Well I absolutely agree with Aradna in terms of we need to get the message out there earlier and also I think the industry needs to get over its own image problem because if you're inside engineering you know how creative and fun it is but we don't necessarily sell that very well um, I also think uh, internally within the industry um, everybody's in charge of unpacking their own stuff so you know men need to look at sexism white people need to look at racism all of that you know we need to work on ourselves as well to make sure that we are being as welcoming as possible and um, I could go on at length about this rant but I think as well the industry needs to pay for its diversity so it should stop relying you know large broadcasters large media organizations that have got multi-million pound incomes should stop relying on the free labor of um, women minority groups people who are constantly giving up their time in order to do the diversity and should actually be backing it by paying for some of that stuff and um, because it's noticeable that it's it's often the people who have been excluded in some way who are doing most of the work in their own time for free to open those doors up and um, I think it would be better if some of that was funded by the industry. Yeah great point great point that you've made there. Um, we have had a question um, come in from Aaron Donnelly Jackson. What a great name. Um, what advice would you give to sound engineers looking to change career or move into radio? What can transfer from live formats? Um, Anne, do you want to uh, uh, answer that one for me? Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you're a sound engineer already, then that's amazing because you know all about how sound works and um, it depends what type of sound engineer you are, if you've been in a recording studio or if you've been doing live stuff or a bit of both, but fundamentally you understand the signal flow. So that is really important, um, especially for broadcast engineering because you know where sound goes and what happens in the middle and where sound comes out. So that's really great because it means it can be scaled up to a broadcast engineering role um, because working out what's, what's happened to a signal is pretty similar whether you're trying to work out if it's going to a satellite or around the sound desk. If you want to do sound engineering itself, um, then really useful for radio. Um, commercial stations, you're probably going to need to be able to do more than just that. Um, but at the BBC, there are specialist jobs called studio managers, and they're effectively the sound engineer role. And there's also work on outside broadcast teams. So it kind of depends which sort of sound engineering you want to do. Um, some people spend their whole time making promos and idents and jingles and using that kind of part of sound engineering. But yes, if you've got those skills, there will definitely be lots of things you can do and be paid for in radio. Is it worth um, mentioning at, at the moment? Um, we, I, so, sorry, Tanya, I mentioned a little bit earlier about something called the Radio Technology Masterclass. Um, so Anne and I at TechCon um, ran one of these last year. Um, and the idea of it is to give an introduction to broadcast engineering um, for 
to anyone you know who are new to um, that sector um, and so we went through the whole of the broadcast chain you know from what kind of um, panelling do you need in in the room or you know what kind of a curtain do you need what kind of kit do you need um, to um, what's the central technical area how do you actually get things um, the sound from the studio to their outer transmitter what is transmission engineering and, and also um, internet and IP um, radio engineering um, and we put all of those uh, videos of those they're delivered by people who work in the industry in those sectors um, all of those videos are on our website at radiotechcon.com and the reason I mention it is that it's quite a useful um, quick place to go and sort of get an understanding of all the different bits along the broadcast chain and so um, you might find that whilst watching that there's a particular bit that appeals to you or you feel you've got a bit more knowledge on and it might give you a starting point of, of where to look and, and how to get in. Um, and also we we have um, a Facebook group uh, with a really active community so um, please feel free to join it and if we can help on there that's a really good way to get in touch with us or you can drop us an email and if there's a, a particular area that you're interested in we probably know someone who will have a chat with you. Fabulous okay thank you for that. Um, we've had a um, I don't think it's a question, but just a, a, a comment, which I, I thought I'll, I'll bring up anyway. Um, Lisa Hack says, the BBC seems to have moved towards studio directors in news, at least. This incorporates studio production skills too. Um, so yeah, like I say, not, not, not a question, but... Um, Lisa's a, a good person to know if you want to do sound stuff at the BBC. Oh, I see. She's amazing. Okay. <laughs> or, or not at the BBC. Or not at the BBC, <laughs> yeah, but yes. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. So um, I, I, I've asked that question that I definitely wanted to get in. So I, I will backtrack a little bit and um, ask the other question I wanted to ask, which was, you both work as producers and technolo technologists slash engineers. Um, and uh, Arada, you began as an engineer, but you were always involved in filmmaking and the arts in your own time. And um, you've already said that you work um, as a producer in all sorts of things, whether it's for large scale um, media events or diversity and inclusion initiatives. And, and Anne, you began as a radio producer, but then turned your hand into engineering. Um, although I understand that you do take on uh, as many producer roles as you do engineering ones. What is it like to be able to work across both fields that way and, and, and have that kind of um, fluidity, I guess? Um, Aradna, if you could answer that one first. I, I mean, I love it. So I, I still do um, technology roles as well. Um, you know, especially technical project manager roles. Um, and I, I also still produce films and I produce events and kind of bring people together in that space. Um, and for me, that that was why I wanted to go freelance to be able to have that kind of connected flexibility to you know to work across all of the areas and personally I, I really think I'm a better um, producer for being an engineer and um, I'm better in my role as a technical project manager or you know technologist whatever um, for really having that in-depth understanding of what it takes to produce something and make a program and the kind of pressures that you have um on yourself um so i mean that's that's definitely a thing you know it's it's better creativity in, in my mind it's better understanding it's you know i can take something from one area to another and kind of be like oh ta -da, this is new it's not new we've been doing it for years <laughs> um and for me personally I, I don't want to I don't want to choose like don't make me choose between them because I, I shouldn't have to and I don't have to um, and so yes there's a lot of um, difficulties in freelance life you know you've already mentioned you, you don't have the same kind of security uh, that you have in a big firm sometimes you don't have as much of the support but for me at this time in my life the benefits um, outweigh that because I, I get to choose these really brilliant projects to work on and you know 
at the beginning of the year I could be um, running a technology project for BBC Radio and doing something fabulous and new and shiny and then later that year I could be in a room full of artists bringing them together talking about why they need to be more inclusive or diverse or you know how to um, use technology better within the arts for example. Um, so yeah I think in terms of my personal uh, well-being that I get from that as well as the work that I can deliver it absolutely just makes sense. What about you Anne? Yeah it's complete magic I mean why would you not want to do both? Um, as a Radner was saying they completely feed each other also as a technology person I have I can walk into a studio and I know exactly how to behave in a studio and I can have a chat to a production team if I'm doing some training or something and immediately you know there's that rapport there because I know what I know how it works um I remember I'll just drop a name but I was I was in Australia uh, and I was very lucky to be on the working with the Carl and Jackie O team which is a huge breakfast show over there and uh, one of those pinch yourself moments and um you know normally they kind of allocate five minutes for a visitor and the rest of my colleagues had to come back after 40 minutes because we were still kind of chatting about ideas and things that we could be doing and I think it was because I was able to go in and I wasn't the stereotypical engineer who kind of like hung out in the background and grunted which they don't do but you know that sort of <laughs> um I was able to rock in as a youngish woman who knew how to make programs and was really genuinely excited to be there and already knew who they were and had already done the basics of listening to the show and I'd watch them speak at a conference and you know I didn't get to chat to them because they were on air but the team immediately knew that I was someone that could be trusted in that space and so um yeah why would you not want to do both because both of your jobs will be better I think the the thing that can be hard is that we don't really have a, a word yet for this sort of I don't know, ambitextrous. Um, so <laughs> there is a word now. <laughs> yeah. So there are a few of us around who do it. And I think for me, the frustration comes more in a kind of a marketing point of view, because when people know me, they kind of know, oh, that's an Anne project. But it can be quite hard to explain in that kind of elevator pitch. Well, I do this and I do that. And I'm kind of good at both of them. But, you know, um, because I think people are more used to pigeonholing people into job roles. and um, that doesn't work anymore because even if you are at work you probably got a job role I mean I was called a project manager for many years it's like well some of my job was managing a project but a lot of it was a lot of other stuff as well so mm -hmm. yeah, I think we get a bit hung up on on job titles rather than on individual ability yeah. to solve problems yeah um, we have had um, questions come in so apologies I, um, I uh, missed them so um, there's one from Hayley Webster she asks, what advice would you give to those going from working for a large broad broadcaster where you feel comfortable and familiar with different processes to having a freelance career? How did you become comfortable and build a network? Um, Aradna, can we start with you on that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I think the, the fact that I had worked for a big broadcaster that has a lot of processes um, actually really helped me. Um, I, I sort of had this idea in mind, like quite, I had a discipline, I suppose, of, um, you know, ways to do things, but then I also had that freedom and flexibility to, to venture off that and kind of this understanding of, um, you know, how I can make it work once I can flex those rigid processes a bit, because I don't think that you want to completely move away from process because it's, it's a good way when you're working uh, for different clients to be able to say, you know, th this is the process, this is what we're going to do. So, you know, I, I took a lot of that with me and then sort of made it my own. Um, and I think also um, it helps you because when I was at the BBC, I moved around departments quite a lot. And um, in such a big organisation, that can be like working for multiple different companies, if you like, in, in one country. <laughs> um, so I think that also helped, you know, being able to very quickly understand different people's processes and being, being able to adapt to them, to sort of what they need and what works for them. And in terms of networks, um, absolutely, you need to keep in touch with all of the people that you've just left. You know, I was leaving the BBC, I wasn't leaving those people. So I, I put effort into making sure they all remember me, that they know what I'm doing, that I'm available to hire, um, get introductions to other people, use networks like LinkedIn. 
um, and conferences like Radio TechCon are a brilliant way to build those networks. So I have a huge network, you know, across all sorts of um, radio sectors that I've never worked in, but I know them and they now know me, they know what I can do and so your, your, um, your network builds in that way. And what about you, Anne? What's helped you? Um, I think the confidence thing, just remember that that's a roller coaster. You're going to have days when you're like, this is the best thing ever. And then the next day you're going to go, I have no skills and I can't do anything. Why am I trying to do So I think just knowing that that's coming is kind of helpful. And remember that you are running a business. Um, I had some really good, I have a, a friend that I paid uh, who's really good at um, understanding things like company structure and doing your first tax return and just telling you what's tax deductible. Um, I can't give financial advice, but often things like coming to Radio TechCon are. Um, and so that, that can be really helpful. Um, and just, just being able to try different things. And I think if you, are, if you are leaving the BBC, then there are a couple of things. Firstly, I think you forget if you work inside the BBC. I forget to say that I've worked at the BBC because it feels, you know, but how much that can open some doors. Um, I, I went and worked abroad immediately after leaving the BBC and went to work in New Zealand and the fact that I'd worked at the BBC was immediately something that that opened doors for me um, so yeah that would be that would be another one and then on a practical level before you leave the BBC find someone who knows how smart book works make them your friend and work out how to get onto it because that can be a process that that's a way that you can be hired at the BBC but it's it's a kind of a dark art and no one really knows how it works and it can take years to be added to it so oh, is that what it's called now smart book I don't know it's probably changed again but the last time I had anything to do with it, it was called smart book and it, it honestly it's it took there was a project that wanted to hire me and they spent about four years trying to hire me because no one could quite work out how to get me on smart book <laughs> And actually, okay. you know, things like that, those sorts of questions, there are no silly questions. So things like the Sound Women Network on Facebook, uh, the Radio Academy, um, all of these things, they do exist. And there's lots of people who've had a lot of experience in this. So you just ask. That, I mean, that's how we found out everything we know by, by going and saying, hi, remember me, have a question. <laughs> We've got one more minute left um, and we do have one question that's come in, but it's divided into three. So I'm just going to pick out one of the questions, um, if you could answer that very quickly for us. So um, what soft, so it, they ask about resources. So what software slash hardware can we look into or demo? Um, oh, I don't know what, the, in what capacity that means. Is, is this for being a freelancer? Is it, you know, looking at well, the, the, the first question was what what does a day in the life of a radio producer slash broadcast engineer look like? And then they they go on to ask about the resources question. Can uh, I just chip in on one bit there? Because there's one thing that often people get really confused about, and that's the difference between a broadcast engineer and a sound engineer. So um, Aradna and I have got some experience of both, but broadcast engineering is about the whole transmission chain. So it's the technology behind a studio all of the stuff in a studio getting stuff to a central area getting stuff around the transmitters and to the audience and a sound engineer is someone who specializes in making the program sound good or creating um, adverts jingles items that kind of thing and so there's a lot of overlap between the two skills but i think sometimes people hear the word engineer in radio and they think we're talking about being sound engineers and actually Arada and i are quite focused on being broadcast engineers um, so in terms of software, that's kind of a how long is a piece of string question because it depends on uh, what I can tell you is how to buy any piece of equipment or software, which is to start off with what you want to do now, what you want to do in the next five years, list the things that are genuinely important that you must have, and then list the things that would be nice to have, and then look at your budget and try not to move too many of the nice to have into the must have pile. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a really good answer. Um, I'm actually going to end it there because we're uh, at one minute past four now. Um, and so uh, we, we do need to wrap up. But thank you very much for everybody that has um, uh, sent through their questions. And thank you very much, Aradna and Anne, for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and um, uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. It's been great fun. Good. Great. All right then, thanks everyone and take care and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Bye.